This is Risky Women Radio, a show to connect, celebrate and champion women in risk, regulation and compliance. Sharing insight and perspective from the most influential members of our global Risky Women Network on the latest developments we need to think about, the challenges we should all talk more about and the innovation we are most excited about in governance, risk and compliance. Bringing together the hundreds of senior women professionals already connected with a new emerging group of leading women and men. I'm Kimberly Cole, your Chief Risky Woman. Welcome to Risky Women Radio. Today's Risky Woman is Nicola Wakefield Evans. Welcome, Nicola. Thank you, Kimberly. So it's great to have you here today. You have had an amazing career that spanned the globe. You've moved from the law to now directorships at some of the leading companies in the world. So can you tell us all about your journey to date and what have been your highlights? I've spent 30 years working as a lawyer, a corporate lawyer, with the firm King & Wood Mallisons, the um, large Australian Chinese law firm. And I had a fantastic experience at that firm where I was allowed to do a number of different roles. I also worked in a number of different cities. So while I was at the firm, I uh, was sent to New York in the 1980s as the first female associate transferred overseas, which at the time was a big issue. I then later had positions in our Perth, Sydney, Melbourne, and then uh, a management role in our Hong Kong office. So that that enabled me to do many different roles in the same organisation. And as big corporate law firms have evolved over the last 30 years, I've been at the forefront of that evolution. And so I got great experience both as a lawyer, but I also got fantastic management experience because I was put on uh, into management roles quite early on in my career as a partner. I was appointed a partner of the firm in 1993. I had client roles. I was the head of our M&A group in Australia. I had uh, partner in charge roles of our Sydney office, which at the time was the biggest office, and then I was appointed managing partner in Australia to look after clients and our partners, and then I was transferred to Hong Kong to look after our international business. Over the years, I just kept taking on different roles and developing. And um, how were those career. opportunities kind of presented to you? Were they sort of things that you were particularly targeting or just things happened along the way? I think it was a mixture. You know, my first big role within the firm was actually a secondment to Esso in the 1980s to work in their upstream oil um, and petroleum business in Australia as a lawyer for a year. And then after that, I was asked if I wanted to go to New York. And it was a big thing for the firm because in the 1980s, women were were just starting to make their careers in the big law firms. Uh, There was a worry about sending a young female lawyer overseas that role sort of was presented to me. I didn't seek it. But certainly some of the roles I did go after. Once I started to get management experience, I obviously wanted to go to the next level. The appointment as managing partner in 2004 and then to go to Hong Kong in 2007 were both quite deliberate choices I made because I was then thinking about, well, where will my career take me? I could be a a lawyer until I retired or I could give myself the opportunity to get better experience or different experience and maybe go into management roles. And it was that move and the move to Hong Kong that ultimately led to the career I've got today as a non-executive director. Mm, So tell us more about that. So you're a non-executive director now, multiple companies and organisations. So I was, my first big um, appointment was in 2011 when I was approached to join the board of Toll Holdings in Australia. At at that stage, Toll was a large listed transport and logistics company. They were specifically looking for somebody who had run a business in Asia, preferably Hong Kong, because they had a big operation in Hong Kong and my name came up. So I was headhunted for that role. But having said that, I had had a lot of experience being on board. So I'd been on my old school board and I chaired the school council. I'd been on a number of client boards and I was the chair of the firm's operating company for some time. So I'd had, you know, a good 15 years experience of being a director. 
And so this just to me seemed to be the next sort of evolution of, of what I should do. So I was still living in Hong Kong when I joined the toll board and then we moved back to Australia and I was then faced with a decision about whether I would continue being a partner of King and Wood Mallison's or would I use the fact that I was now on one listed board to try and get further appointments. And that was a very interesting process. I spoke to a lot of people and in 2013 I was asked to join the boards of Bupa Australia and New Zealand and then Lend Lease, the big Australian property and construction company. And those two appointments led to my decision to retire as a partner and become a a non-executive director. And then shortly after my retirement, I was asked to join the board of Macquarie. It's brilliant. And obviously both in your legal career and now in your um, director career, you've got a really broad portfolio of different companies from banks, construction, et cetera. And that'll be interesting for us to understand from that board perspective, risks and, and how you manage those. So what were the motivations around your career choices? So I guess initially, why, you know, why did you decide to go into the law? What was your passion there? Well, my, um, my father was a lawyer and we, so I, I guess I grew up surrounded by um, lawyers and, and some very interesting lawyers in the 1960s and 1970s and 80s in Australia. Both my parents actually had friends uh, who were, professors of law, partners of law firms, head of the civil liberties organisation in Australia. My father was a magistrate. So I saw a big cross-section. And at the time, it wasn't common for women to do law degrees. I actually originally wanted to be a pilot and to, (laughs) to be a commercial pilot, but I was a couple of years too early and um, the Australian Royal Australian Air Force rejected my application to join the Air Force once they found out that I was a woman. And so I decided to follow my father, uh, follow in his footsteps, a decision he was thrilled about. Both my parents were very encouraging and I was brought up to believe I could do anything. So I didn't see any roadblocks uh, mm. when I first went to university. I was also lucky to go to the University of New South Wales Law School at a time when it was a new law school in Sydney, it was try it was trying to be very different from the established law, law school that was there. And so I was at, there at a time when it was very exciting to be both a student of the law school at that university, to be at that university, and also to be at a time when more and more women were doing law. And I was lucky also to be in a graduating year that contained some remarkable women like Shamara Wickramanaika, who's just become CEO of Macquarie, Elizabeth Broderick, who was the former Australian Sex Discrimination Commissioner, Cheryl Bart, who's an explorer but has had a very successful career as a company director, Maxine Brenner, who's also a, a non-executive director and former lawyer. So we didn't see ourselves at the time as doing anything different, but I think we've supported each other for over 35 years and have all been very successful. And we, I put it down to the support that we got from a number of people, but also the university we went to. Mm, an amazing alumni. So you, you've also been very celebrated. Um, you were selected as a member of Advance Asia 50 as one of the most influential Australians living and working in Asia in 2011 as a member of the Global 50 for uh, uh, leading Australian women working outside of Australia and the Financial Review named you in 2013 as one of the inaugural 100 Women of Influence. What lessons can you share with us that you've kind of learnt along the way in your career? A couple of things. I have been lucky to have both mentors and sponsors and I think that's incredibly important, particularly for women throughout their careers. It's not something you you really should seek at any particular stage. But I had I was lucky to have a couple of very outstanding women who were slightly ahead of me at King and Wood Mallison's, Robin Chalmers, who became the first female chairman of a, a major law firm, uh, Lana Atlas, who's now the chair of Coca-Cola Amatol, who I worked with in New York, and Her Honour Justice Julie Ward, who's now on the Supreme Court of New South Wales. And they were real 
leaders in the way they behaved, the way they mentored, sponsored and supported young female lawyers coming up behind them. They all showed fantastic characteristics of leadership. So I was, I have always said I was really lucky to be in a, mm. at a firm that had inspiring women like that. Uh, I also learned very early to take risks because I watched my male contemporaries and noticed that a lot of them did take risks with their careers. They were ambitious and they were brave. And I thought, well, there's no reason why I can't be the same, why, you know, it was risky for me to go to New York as a young lawyer. It was also risky for me to go to Hong Kong in 2007 with four school-aged children and a husband who had a big career of his own and to just move everybody from Australia to Hong Kong. But they're calculated risks. You know, I, I went into them with my eyes wide open. The other thing I've always done is planned. I'm a big believer in things happen for a reason and you can also plan for things to happen. So I've always had an idea about where I wanted to go, not necessarily how it would happen, but I've always set myself goals. And I sort of started doing that in my late 20s. And I still do it today. You know, what would I like to be doing in five years' time? And when you think like that, you don't have a lot of time then to do the planning or to take the actions that will get you to that outcome. And uh, it's advice I give to a lot of young women today. Don't take anything for granted. Plan what you want to do. If you want to work overseas, work out how you're going to do it. If you want to continue on a career trajectory, if you want to get into senior management, you have to build the foundations to do that. Fantastic. So mentors and sponsors take calculated risks, be ambitious and brave and plan. Fabulous advice. Now, you mentioned several women that have helped you along the way and been, I guess, role models. Who are some of the other role models that you've, you know, really been inspired by? The first role model I was inspired by was my mother. She uh, was very unusual. She worked pretty much my whole childhood, which in the 60s and 70s was unusual. But she did some very interesting things. She worked in New South Wales to make sure that women had work-based childcare. So she set up the early policies and procedures to enable governments and corporations to set up work-based childcare centres because she understood that if we were going to get more women into the workforce, we had to deal with the question of childcare. She went to university when I was 10 and uh, because there was no childcare at that stage, she used to take my younger sister with her into the lectures and just park her in the bassinet under her table. <laughs> and she was very, very conscious that she didn't want that for, for us or for women coming behind her. She also had a view that women could do anything and that you shouldn't be held back by inequality or laws that prevented you from doing what you wanted. She was my first major role model. And then, you know, an early person I really admired was Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who's mm. just chalked up 25 years as a Supreme Court judge in the US. But in the 60s and 70s, for a young law student, she was one of a handful of lawyers who were really changing the world for women. She she worked on a lot of seminal um, inequality cases and discrimination cases in the US. She had a very smart way of thinking she was the person who coined the word gender inequality. She didn't want the word sexual inequality be, to be used because she thought it would lead to people thinking about the wrong thing. And it's interesting that there's a spotlight on Ruth Bader Ginsburg today because her career has been inspiring, particularly for, for a lawyer. And then there are women um, like... Um, Diane Smith and a lot of the top Australian corporate women who have worked really hard to change the landscape for women in corporate Australia. She was the president of Chief Executive Women and she joined a long line of fantastic women who have worked really hard to increase the number of women in both executive and non-executive roles. Mm, very inspirational, the uh, RBG uh, documentary that's out at the moment. So. 
Let's shift gears a little bit and get into the sort of expert opinion piece. Really keen to get some of your thoughts and and the view from your sort of vantage at the board level. So given your position on several, you know, of Australia's leading companies as a board director, can you share what are the key characteristics that you think are important for a high-performing board And what are the attributes of board directors that they need to hold to be effective in delivering their duties? It's a really interesting question, Kimberly. And at the outset, I want to say that I think, particularly in Australia, but globally, the role of non-executive directors is under the spotlight at the moment. And in Australia, it's under the spotlight because of the Royal Commission into the Financial Institutions, the report which was handed to the government yesterday and will be published next week, we'll have a lot to say about how our biggest organisations are run, including how the boards operate. We've had the regulators with a spotlight on how boards operate. And I really think that the role of a, of a modern non-executive director has been evolving over the last, pretty much the last 20 years, but it's really accelerating at the moment. There's been a change in community attitudes. The c- communities demand, I think, and are, will continue to demand a lot more of non-executive directors. So that means that the attributes you need to have, the mix of directors on a board, companies and boards need to pay more attention. So um, the key characteristics for a high-performing board, the biggest one is to have a mix of directors with a mix of skills, diversity and backgrounds. There's a lot of debate at the moment about what a high-performing board should look like and I really think that it's going to be different for every different organisation. So there's not one a one-size-fits-all, right. mm. there's not the same formula and directors and chairmen need to be a lot more proactive around seeking potential directors with the right skills and to make sure that those skills and the characteristics of the director fit with the other directors. Um, There's a lot of debate for them at the moment, for example, that every board needs somebody with cyber security expertise or innovation expertise or AI expertise. I don't really buy into that. I think that you need to, each board needs to look at the organisation, where that organisation is on its journey and what skills are needed at that particular time and then looking into the future. more work. There's no doubt that more and more work is now being done by boards around succession. Chairmen are looking more out to a three- to five-year horizon around the skills they need and making sure that they don't have gaps either unexpected or expected that that come along and that they have identified potential directors who could join a particular board. High-performing boards, I think, also need to have people who can look over the horizon. Interestingly, boards have a a much longer-term view of a company and its performance than necessarily the executive team's. So you need to have people who have experience at looking at what's coming, where disruption is, where innovation's coming, change in regulatory approaches, change in competitor mix, and who are constantly thinking about those issues. And that really, I think, is something that's evolving much more around what is expected of a board because executive teams are busy managing companies Boards need to do, I think, a lot more around strategy. So a high-performing board will spend more time on strategy than a board that's not performing well. And by that I mean not only setting the strategy for a short, medium and long term, but also looking at the, the performance of the company against the strategy, constantly testing that, seeking views about whether there needs to be a change in strategy or whether the company is actually performing against the strategy set out by the board and the senior management team. Yeah, I mean, there there was some feedback in one of the reports that came out before the Banking Royal Commission about how do you or the need to really drive critical thinking and thinking about the bigger picture. 
Um, and obviously the board's setting the strategy, but how does the board help the organisation in terms of their ability to learn and anticipate and adapt as well is, is key. And we can get into more of the, the measures and processes, but how, we, how does the board help sort of track that without being operational, I guess? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I, I'm i seeing, um, and I'm, it's, it's certainly my, my experience, a number of boards now bringing in experts to talk to them about different things. That's the first thing. The second thing is boards need to understand their organisation. I think the days of not visiting offices, factories, work sites, and also understanding the competitive landscape are gone. Directors need to understand the business that the company's in, the competitive landscape, and you need to, I'm a, I'm a big fan of directors getting out and going into the company, visiting different offices. On two of the boards I sit on, we do uh, trips overseas where we go to every region that we operate in and we spend a lot of time with our employees and that's done through a whole different range of things, having lunches, meetings, presentations, walking the floor, walking around construction sites. There's no better way to actually get a feel for the culture and how a company is operating than to see how its employees are performing. Um, and I, it's it's absolutely fundamental. And I think it has been done for a long time with those companies that look at safety, where safety is a number one risk for them, so mm. construction companies, transport companies. But I think this is something that all boards now need to do. They need to understand their organisation. And that's interesting as well, that, that corporate culture piece. So, you know, tone at the top has been a really hot topic given some of the corporate scandals and, and the misconducts that we've seen. So how do you get that strong corporate culture and uh, for better compliance and risk and business outcomes? What are boards focusing on in order to sort of really influence that tone at the top? Well, the f- firstly, the board needs to understand what the culture is. So what are the values of the organisation? What's the ethical climate that they're operating in? There are a number of ways to test that. You know, do you understand? Do you Have you read the company's code of conduct? Have you um, interrogated the head of risk or the general counsel or the head of compliance about the compliance against codes of conduct? What statistics does the board get about breaches? Mm. around codes of conduct or indeed any code, you know, the the um, technology code, the travelling code, any of those sort of things are actually a really good measure of how employees abide by the rules that are set in the organisation. And the rules will be different depending on what that organisation does. But I have observed that there's a difference in language between those companies that deal with safety, where they are absolutely clear that having safe work practices is an imperative, that they will not tolerate unsafe work practices. The language that they use in their codes of conduct, on their websites, in their annual reports, in their public documents about safety is absolutely clear. When you look at companies in other industries, for example, the financial services industry, the language around misconduct is not as clear as that safety language and I think we need to move to that. We need to make it clear to our employees that they need to operate ethically, they need to comply with the rules, they need to comply with codes of conduct and it's not until we're going, we get to that stage. And I think the Royal Commission, Banking Royal Commission in Australia showed that the companies had all the codes mm. but they weren't monitoring compliance or they allowed the compliance to drift to suit business imperatives. Or also not challenging and looking at really what was best practice. Um, That's because, right. Because, you know, you think about some of the things where people could say, oh, we've had no calls to our whistleblower hotline. Well, that should probably ring an alarm bell rather than it being seen as a success. That's right. Um, so it's kind of interesting in terms of how how companies interpret That's right. a lot of the statistics. So, so on a couple of my boards, the boards are now getting monthly statistics from um, HR or the legal team around breaches of codes 
and the consequence management side because that's as important as understanding the statistics around compliance is what are you doing about it and how are you measuring, Mm. measuring and communicating what you're doing around breaches because it's really important that employees and executives understand that there will be consequences and that the company is going to be clear about enforcing them. So obviously managing risks is, is very key for, for boards and there's also this, you know, 360-degree view that you need to have and one of the things that came out of um, one of the reports from the banking perspective was that, you know, the financial performance had actually been very good and so therefore perhaps there wasn't enough challenging of what was the operational risk, what were the compliance risks that, you know, that was highlighted by several of the regulators. So, you know, what you're saying, you've, you're kind of getting a dashboard, you, you've got right. a better view and you're being able to be more proactive and preempt some of this That's, that's exactly right. Yeah. So I think dashboards are really important and the board needs to get the information. The board has to say to management, we need to see and then outline what statistical information um, and I guess that gives get. also a view then of what the management's monitoring as well. That's, so That's exactly right. And I, I do think there's going to be more focus this year on um, making sure that boards are getting the right information because the other thing that came out in the Royal Commission was some boards not getting timely information about correspondence with regulators and mm. interaction with regulators and their regulatory policies probably weren't as sharp as they should have been. My view is that's all being reviewed and boards are saying, you know, this is what we require. Things like material correspondence needs to go to the chair and the the board within 24 hours, Mm. particularly if there's a potential reputation impact. Secondly, that there should be a policy that you respond to regulators within a, a certain amount of time. Very what I would think quite simple measures but again looking at that and then making sure that that policy is enforced. Yeah and the interesting thing as well that you've mentioned um, but I'd love to dig a bit deeper into is obviously you sit on um, Macquarie so financial uh, banking then you've got uh, Lendlease what do you learn across the different industries and and even beyond the boards that you sit on where do you think you can apply industry best practice and how do you do that from one industry to another? That's actually one of the most interesting parts of being a non-executive director with a portfolio of directorships because you see how different companies respond to different issues. And if I go back to what we were talking about, what makes a what it does a high performing board look like. Part of it is having directors who have a cross-section of different experiences, who are on different boards, who have done different things, so that they can bring different ideas. It's the difference of ideas that I actually find really exciting because you can't assume that the organisation that you're on the board actually has the best of anything. And, in fact, you want them to be continually thinking about doing better so do we have the best safety policy? Lend Lease, which prides itself on having an uncompromising view about unsafe work practices, changed the way it approached safety uh, materially um, about six or seven years ago. Steve McCann, who's the CEO, decided that there were a number of jurisdictions in the world where we could not work safely so Lend Lease got out of those jurisdictions. It's very unusual for companies to do that and to base that decision on a safety mm. issue. He then um, had, the, had the team, the executive team, work on how do we get to the next level to operate safely? What do we have to do? And a lot of work was done where we now have minimum standards for everything we do. And did and he look at other construction companies or did he go and look at he looked, airlines he looked or... at he looked the company looked globally at best practice in our industry but also in you know what other industries were doing we did look at the airline industry mm. because 
they do offer, you know, say they're obsessed with safety. Yeah. We wanted to get obsessed with safety, which I think largely that he's achieved that with this focus on safety. And it's an example of where you can look at a whole lot of different things to actually build something that's better yeah. within an organisation and change the culture. And Lynn Lease, in my view, definitely changed its safety culture became obsessed mm. about it. It wanted to be as good as the best performing companies in the world, whatever industries they were in from a safety perspective. That's not to say, though, we can rest on our laurels. Safety is one of those things that you have to be right on top of and you have to be continually taking it to the next level because safety is all about the performance of people. Mm. Why do your people do something and if you look at accidents and incidents, a lot of them are because somebody wants to either take a shortcut or they've not put in place things that need to be put in place to do something. How do you get inside an employee or a contractor's head to make sure that they don't do that? There's lessons to be learnt there for financial institutions on misconduct. And We've maybe got, some of our sporting institutions. And may, maybe some of our sporting institutions as well <laughs> in relation to culture. So you mentioned a lot about, you know, diversity and I guess ultimately diversity of thought, skills, etc. And you also chair the 30% Club in Australia. Congratulations that this week just slightly missed the 30% but very close. So what is your ambition now for uh, the 30% Club? It's a very complex question. The goal that was set in 2014 by a combination of the Australian Institute of Company Directors and the 30% Club Australia was to have 30% of non-executive directors of the ASX 200, so the top 200 listed companies in Australia, reach 30% of female non-executive directors by the end of 2018. We announced last week that we've reached 29.7%, so we're really close Really pleasingly, we've done that over nearly four years without quotas. It's involved the work of an enormous number of people. So obviously the AICD, the 30% Club committees, but we also have 100 of our top chairmen of our listed companies who are involved. We've had great support from the federal and state governments. I'd like to call out Kelly O'Dwyer, who's been a staunch supporter of the 30% Club and the concept since it was brought in, and the ASX, of course, with its um, governance guidelines for listed companies. We're not going to sit on our laurels, though. The goal was deliberately set for a group of companies. We now need to make it a sticky goal so that 30% is the floor, but we need to make it a, a goal to reach a, a larger number of organisations. Interestingly, over the four years, we've seen a big shift in the appointment of women on government boards. Most state governments now have a minimum requirement of 40 to 50 percent or 40, 40, 20 or 50, 50, and most of them are well above 40 percent. So the concept has actually dragged a really good performance in other areas. And we've seen this, the same in a number of, of our large public, mm. uh, sorry, private institutions. We need to do more in relation to organisations like sporting bodies. Um, we need more women on some of our sporting bodies. We're likely to expand the number of companies that we want to reach 30%. If you look at the total portfolio of listed companies in Australia, the statistic is not fantastic. If you look at, for example, at the ASX 300, we're just under 20%. So we've actually got a long way to go. But what we'd like to do is use this really great piece of work that we've done to date to now look more broadly across our institutions in Australia. Yeah, and the performance globally is actually pretty impressive given the no mm -hmm. quotas. So obviously yeah, the Scandinavian countries are higher with quotas, but compared to especially a lot of the Asian countries, you know, Hong Kong's at 13.8% women. So it's actually going yeah, it's strongly going, in the right direction. It's going in the right direction. And we are really pleased with, particularly after last year, where we thought that we might go backwards after a number of very public issues that happened last year in relation to women. 
But pleasingly, I think we've got the momentum. So our goals will be to make it sticky so that for the 200, we don't go below 30%. Mm -hmm. And then to broaden the number of companies that we will require 30% female directors. And what have you seen? Obviously, there's been a lot of changes in gender diversity over the length of your career at both executive and non-exec level. What have been the key changes that you've seen and kind of the impact do you think that that's made? There is almost no role now that women can't do. So if you look at just the last 30 years, we've had a lot more female lawyers, which is the the profession I come out of. We have a lot more women in corporate roles. Still not enough. I mean, we've talked about non-executive directors. Our statistics on executive Mm. uh, female directors, so women in top executive teams in in companies, is not fantastic. And that is another goal that we're we're going to work towards and work with organisations like Chief Executive Women and the AICD and the ASX because they are the pipeline for the non-executive side. We need to increase the number of women in senior roles in our organisations. I think the other thing I've seen and I've observed over my working life are policies to encourage, attract and retain women in the workforce, but policies that actually now work for all of our workers. So maternity leave has led to paternity leave so or family leave. Flexible working environments, flexible working hours is a benefit that is now available to both men and women. It's really accelerated a change in attitude about how we work and that's benefited both men and women. But I think it's just the sheer number of women coming into the workforce that's enabled us to do that. And I do think that cultures change as you get more women in a workplace. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the support of uh, initiatives like the Male Champions of Change and the work that Liz Broderick did has been incredible as well and and such a huge change. And that's become a global phenomenon. We've Mm. got um, the equivalent in Hong Kong. Liz is is rolling out Male Champions of Change globally. Yeah, through her UN role, yeah. Through her UN role. So it's absolutely fantastic. Connecting, celebrating and championing women in risk regulation and compliance, Risky Women Radio takes an intimate look at the rants and revelations of the top women shaping the debate and the industry. So, my favourite part of the uh, podcast now, rants and revelations. So let's start with your revelation. What's your top piece of advice that you have been given and that's really helped you progress your career so that you would provide to our more emerging women and men in risk regulation and compliance? I'm going to say what I told a group of young students in Hong Kong last weekend, be brave and be ambitious. Yes, love it. And right, your rant. If you were ruler of the world for a day, what would you change or if you had that magic wand that you could? It's two things. I would remove all forms of inequality. Sadly, we've talked about the great strides women have made in breaking down barriers, but the pace of gender equalisation has been slow and the latest World Economic Forum estimates that it will take 217 years until we achieve gender parity of solve gender parity globally Mm. so I think that's a it's a huge issue and then my one of my passions is we need to solve the scourge of domestic violence which arguably claims more lives annually than terrorism but receives a minuscule amount of government funding globally and it's a real barrier in holding women back just the sheer amount of violence that women are subjected to Risky Women is a vibrant network at the centre of a global community in a rapidly growing, evolving and influential industry. Given the continued pace of change, our Rapid Fire Round revisits the most pressing topics to share ideas and offer listeners new perspectives. So what are your predictions or key trends for the year ahead? I think it's going to be an interesting year. If I look at Australia 
We've got several elections. Um, We've got a federal election and a state election. We've got the Royal Commission into Financial Institutions, the report of which will be announced next week. There's also a current Royal Commission into Aged Care. Mm. There's a lot of reviews of different industries. So I think it's going to be an interesting year in Australia. It's going to be a year of two halves. The first half with the election, the, the you know, the New South Wales state election and the federal election. And then hopefully the second half we'll see things becoming more stable once we have a, a new government in place. And given those thoughts, but from a world perspective, are you optimistic, pessimistic or neutral in your outlook for 2019? I have to say I'm generally an optimistic person. However, I am neutral about 2019 and I'm neutral because while global economies are still growing at approximately 3%, which they have been doing since the GFC, there are headwinds and the risks are building. We don't know how Brexit's going to play out and that will have an impact. We don't know how the trade wars are going to play out. We don't know how the Chinese economy will go. Those three things alone, and there are a lot of other things that are happening, could have big impacts on the on the world economy. Absolutely. And before we get into a few more fun ones, we like to ask, what's your cure for the cost of compliance? Be smarter, use technology better and embed a culture of compliance. Fabulous. So what's a book that you recommend that everyone reads? So my favourite book over the last couple of years has been 40 Autumns by Nina Wilner. She's American and has worked for a long time in American intelligence. The book, though, is the story of her family who was split between East and West Germany. So it's the story of her mother's family and her mother escaping East Germany, but she tells the story of how East Germany became the subject to the regime it became subject to. And what I find fascinating is that the things that happened there we're now seeing happening globally. So there are really scary parallels from her book and her story, and it's a beautifully written memoir. It really is. But it's it's got these scary parallels about what happened to East Germany and what's happening today. Excellent. Something to watch. RBG. So I've already spoken about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She There's a, a very interesting documentary of her life, which is currently available, which is just inspiring because it demonstrates just the impact she's had, not only in America, but, you know, she made governments change laws to remove gender inequality and governments all over the world copied what America did after uh, she took a lot of states to court in the 60s and 70s. And then there's a movie just about to be released called um, On the Basis of Sex, which is a movie about one of the cases that she prosecuted with her husband to bring, it was a groundbreaking gender discrimination case before the US Court of Appeals. So um, I think it's the year of RBG. She's become a bit of an icon, particularly amongst young women, um, just because she she's had this fantastic career where she's been single-minded and, and in the pursuit of removing gender inequality. And the movie's time to um, celebrate her 25 years as a judge on the Supreme Court of the US. Fantastic. And we all, of course, love a good podcast. So what's your uh, favourite podcast? Well, Whiskey Women, of course, (laughs) but um, I'd like to call out two if I could. Women with Clout, so Catherine Fox and Jane Caro, and Chat 10 Looks 3 with Lee Sales and Annabelle Crabb. Two of my favourites as well. Well, thank you very much, Nicola Wakefield-Evans, for being our Risky Women, and uh, it's been a fantastic chance to have a conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. This episode is brought to you by our founding sponsor, Refinitiv. Refinitiv serves more than 40,000 institutions in over 190 countries. Refinitiv provides information, insights and technology that drive innovation and performance in global financial markets. Refinitiv enables the financial community to trade smarter and faster, overcome regulatory challenges and scale intelligently. 
Thank you for listening to this exciting episode of Rescue Women Radio to connect, champion, and celebrate women in risk regulation and compliance. I'm Kimberly Cole, based in Hong Kong. For more information on the Risky Women Global Network, head to our website in the episode notes and please be a part of the ongoing conversation by subscribing to this podcast, connecting with us at Risky Women on Twitter, or even reaching out to me directly by email.